thank you for coming. Uh, this is the first of five programs on criminal justice in Vermont, and we're really excited about this series. Uh, the mission statement of the League is empowering voters and depending, defending democracy, and we hope that these programs advance that mission. And there's information about the League on the back table, and we would be very happy to have you join us. Our moderator is Carrie Brown, Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. The commission is a state agency working to help women achieve legal, economic, social, and political equality in Vermont. And Carrie will introduce our panel. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Uh, we have an amazing panel here today, and um, I'm so honored to be able to be here to talk with you about them. Let me find their bios. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> I wish I could. I, I I wish I had all of them memorized, but unfortunately no. Um, so I'm going to start right here. Ashley Messier is um, she is the smart justice organizer for the ACLU of Vermont. She's also a consultant for the Cabot Centennial Reentry Project. Mm -hmm. Ashley's worked on reforming the criminal justice system for several years, and quite a, quite a while. I've got a good history with that, actually. <laughs> and currently works on several social issue and direct service projects from reentry to domestic and sexual violence. Ashley is a passionate advocate, public speaker, and formerly incarcerated woman. She's also a mom, a wife, and a lifelong Vermonter. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, Cassie Tibbet next. She started volunteering with, the, with Vermont's Incarcerated Women in 2016. She was an instructor for the Speak Debate Prison Initiative, and later she joined Writing Inside Vermont as a writing assistant and a co-editor of the organization's second publication, which is titled Lifelines, Rewriting Lies from the Inside Out. Cassie's also hosted discussion groups and voter registration drives for the women at the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. She's dedicated to empowering others through education and community building, and in her, the rest of the time, as <laughs> I just said, she's the coordinator of the Community Legal Information Center, which is a, and a research fellow for the Center for Justice Reform at Vermont Law School and a volunteer advocate at criminal record expungement clinics and a, commun a circles of support and accountability COSA volunteer, which you may hear more about when she speaks. And Mary Beth Redmond, finally, it was elected to the Vermont House of Representatives in November of 2018. She uh, currently serves on the House Human Services Committee and the Joint Legislative Child Protection Committee. She's helping to lead the Women's Legislative Caucus in its advocacy for more transformative alternatives to across. Oh, sure. More. Do I have a microphone? I don't. More transformative alternatives to incarceration for women. In 2017, she was appointed one of 16 commissioners to the Vermont Commission on Women, which makes her one of my bosses. <laughs> <laughs> so say nice Not things really. about me. <laughs> Mary Beth is a longtime writer and journalist. Her work and career have focused on utilizing writing and public communications to raise up the voices of women, girls, and the most marginalized residing in our state. She currently serves as a partner in the Vermont Story Lab Project, training nonprofit communicators to weave storytelling through the fabric of their organizations to increase impact, impact and reach. She co-founded a program for Vermont's incarcerated women, which I mentioned before that Cassie has worked with, called Writing Inside Vermont which utilizes writing as a tool for self-change. This effort resulted in a nationally published book of the women's poetry and prose entitled Hear Me, See Me in 2013. So we have two books that have come out of this program. Mary Breath also directed the development and communications efforts of Vermont Works for Women, a nonprofit organization training vulnerable women for meaningful livable wage employment. While there, she served on the steering committee of Change the Story Vermont, an innovative project that aligns policy, program, and philanthropy to fast track women's economic status in the state. Prior to making her Vermont her home in 2003, Mary Beth worked as an on air TV reporter in Connecticut, New York, and Indiana. She holds a master's degree from the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism and a bachelor's from the University of Notre Dame. 
Okay, so are you all impressed with our panel? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming here, everyone. And thanks to all of you for coming here to hear about this uh, incredibly important topic. So uh, as Kate said, I work for the Vermont Commission on Women, and we have been working to uh, in advance rights and opportunities for women in Vermont since 1964, and we have been working very hard on issues related to incarcerated women for much, many of those years, much of that time. And I started in this job seven years ago, and I was actually a member of the commission, as Mary Beth is, before that. And so in my time working with the commission, I have seen tremendous changes happen for incarcerated women in Vermont. So 20 years or so ago, we had, what, maybe 35, 40 women who were incarcerated. They were in Waterbury at the state complex there. That's where the prison for women was. And uh, as we saw nationally, um, the numbers of women who were incarcerated really began to climb quite dramatically, and Vermont was no exception. And so the women were actually moved out of that facility in Waterbury um, maybe like 15 years ago, I'm not sure of the exact date, and they were moved to Windsor, to the Southeast State Correctional Facility. And Windsor used to be, it's a farm, and it has had various incarnations in its life. Um, owned by the state, and uh, women there were able to move from building to building. They had lots of outdoor space. They had space for a program that Vermont Works for Women ran called the Modular Home Program, where they actually built modular homes. They built houses. And then those houses were donated to people in the community through Habitat for Humanity, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so it was a really incredible program where you could learn trades, you could learn carpentry, you could also learn about what it was, what, what was involved in giving an estimate on a job site and all the other skills that go along with being employed in general. And um, then for, um, I don't know exactly what the reasons were, but um, one thing we find is that when budgets need to be cut and things need to be rearranged in state budgets and state uh, operations, um, there's a little bit of a pecking order sometimes, and people who are in prison are definitely down near the bottom of that. And um, so the women were moved to St. Albans. And they were moved to actually, you know, not a bad facility, they had lots of room. They were able to continue, for example, the modular home project along with lots of other kinds of programming and education that gave people real job skills that they might use when they left. But then the next round, <coughs> budget pressures came and um, behind the scenes machinations and the women were moved in 2011 to the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. So this is a, a a building in South Burlington that was built as a detention facility. So it was intended for people who were arrested, they, their fate was unknown, they were just being detained and hanging out for a while. And now it's housing people who are living there, who are actually you know, serving out their sentences and living there. It's, um, and there are, I don't know how many there are today, but probably about 150 mm -hmm. in there now. And at its most crowded, it's been up to maybe 185 or 186. so. 186, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's a little bit down from where it's been uh, at, its, at its highest, but it is, um, it's past the gills. And there's no room for the modular home program was, was gone. There were many, um, I'm editorializing a little bit here, you'll, you'll bear with me, but there were many visions for things that might happen with a prison located in Chittenden County that have not necessarily come to pass. And so the, the options for programming and education are possibly not what they, what they could be in an ideal world, but we may hear more about that as we go. Uh, so um, this is uh, really significant to all of us because when we look at how we, how we treat our most vulnerable people, uh, it tells us a lot about what our values are as a society. And so tonight, I'm really pleased that we'll get to hear from three people who have worked very extensively in lots of different aspects of um, this system and who can give us a little bit of insight about how things are, where they might go, what might happen. Okay. 
So uh, we're going to have some questions for them. I'm going to have some questions that I pose to them, and we're going to talk for a little while, and then uh, we will have an opportunity for questions from all of you. All right, so I wanted to um, just give everybody a chance, first of all, to just start and tell us, take about five minutes and tell us what it is that you would like to know, what you'd like us to know about your experience and about your perspective. And we'll just start with Ashley and work our way down to Mary Beth. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out this evening. Uh, important things from my perspective. I think today's kind of an exciting day. So yesterday, uh, we launched our blueprint uh, for Vermont, looking at sort of every point in the system uh, and opportunities for reform and change. And that was really informed by, you know, not only my experience, but, you know, looking at Vermont as a whole and opportunities to uh, really shine. I think one thing that makes us as Vermonters really special is our connection to each other. Uh, usually you can't go five people here without figuring out that you know somebody or you're even related or like went to school with their sister. And it's just a really close knit community, right? That, that makes us Vermont. Uh, and so when you take, especially, uh, a woman out of her community, a lot of times women are the primary parents, like I was. So now you've not only incarcerated me, but now you've created a cycle for my child, right? So now our foster care system in Vermont is completely inundated with many, many kids. And there are opportunities to keep kids with parents and keep them safe. It's, it's not always an either or in a lot of situations. Uh, a lot of the women, including myself, who are incarcerated at CRCF, uh, deal with things like trauma, domestic violence, human trafficking, substance abuse, mental health conditions. All of those right, are, are better served in the community. So the blueprint really gets to building it alternatives to incarceration, keeping things rooted in community, which then creates healthier communities, right? And it keeps families together and it keeps people employed and it helps Vermont in sort of every aspect from economics to community to family to holidays to just sort of every topic that you can, can go through. And, you know, myself being at CRCF, uh, while I will agree that the conditions there are awful, I mean very awful, I mean, just I don't need to get into graphic detail, but yes, that's like everybody can agree with that, right? That something needs to be done. But before we jump to spending hundreds of millions of dollars of your money, your taxpayer money, we need to study alternatives. We need to study smarter ways to spend the money and have better outcomes and keep communities safe. <coughs> and so my work has really been both from my perspective and my children's perspective but also looking at policy and opportunity for Vermont to move forward and, and do better, because we can be leaders. We have before here, right? Vermont has a small population, and we might have smaller numbers than any other state, but that's also an opportunity, right, to, to make change and, and to come out in front and to be really committed to our communities the way that we say that we are. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> when you live it, it's, it's easy to have a good answer. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'll just, I'm Cassie, and I'll just share the story of how I ended up here, and we'll start there. Uh, so I moved to Vermont four years ago, and I moved here to start law school, and I came with the intent to pursue a career as a public defender. And in my first semester, they set up mock interviews with attorneys in the area, and so I sat down with a public defender in the area, and she asked me why I wanted to be a public defender. And my answer, just without thinking, of course, is, well, everyone deserves a second chance. And she said, I'm really glad you feel that way, but it's not a public defender's job to advocate for a second chance, you know, innocent until proven guilty. You're assuming that the individual is guilty. She asked me to try again. So I did, and I said, well, uh, I want to be a voice for others. And without you know, putting her hand on mine and saying, sweetie, she said, 
I think you should spend a summer in a public defender's office and then you'll know what a public defender does. Uh, so the interview was over. Thank goodness it was not real. Uh, <laughs> I kind of walked out and was feeling a little frustrated, but also a little confused, you know, and I decided to, I needed to go on like a soul searching mission. Like what did it mean to me to be a voice for others and why did I want to do that? So I just started reading piles of nonfiction and taking any criminal law class that I could. And then I started volunteering at CRCF. And I started, as mentioned, with a debate program. It was very structured. It was a really great program. But then I saw a flyer on the wall for a writer's group, which was writing inside Vermont. And they did poetry. And that was a little bit more up my alley. So I switched groups. and. I just, there was nothing that could have prepared me, like none of the books or the classes I took or people I talked to for the emotion that was in those rooms during those writers groups, just the emotions that were shared, the emotions I felt and that, you know, I, I witnessed. And then I realized that these women in particular at CRCF, they don't need me to speak for them. What they need is for their own voices to be heard. And so then that inspired me to get involved with the second publication of Writing Inside Vermont, uh, which is Lifelines also mentioned. And it just was published and <coughs> launched in August, but I ordered a box and they're on back order. So did not bring any with me, but um, that's not the point of why we're here tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> to sell books, but yeah. So, and then that's where I am. And I realized that yeah, I don't need to be the voice for them, and their own voices need to be heard because they do deserve a second chance. And so, yeah, I am a licensed practicing attorney now, not a public defender yet. Uh, I'm focusing a lot on reentry and trans mm -hmm. helping individuals transition back into the community. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow, very cool. Um, so, I, I really appreciate what you mentioned about people. Um, about people um, being given an opportunity to voice their lives and their experiences, because that's very much the auspices around writing inside and how it was really why it was created. It wasn't for um, you know for us to go in and, and, and create this book. It was for really to give women a space to speak for themselves and then put it put their words out on a blog so that the whole larger world could really hear their voices. Um, Thus, Hear Me, See Me, which is the title of the, the first book. Um, I really, I'm a deep believer in the fact that we need to be in mutual relationship with other people. It's not just a one-way thing. And I really believe deeply that I have learned more about my life from um, inside women and um, you know, and people who live on the margins than um, any you know course or uh, academic institution could ever teach me. Um, so really, the program was founded as a way to give voice to the women. It was started up in St. Albans. Carrie mentioned the the women were moved four times in ten years. Um, and so we started the program up in St. Albans, and I got to see, you know, St. Albans wasn't a great, um, Northwest is not a great facility, but it, at least the women could walk. They have a big, huge um, walking space outside, so they would walk for miles every day um, and uh, had a garden and different things, and it just became so obvious when they moved to Chindin what they lost. I mean, all of their training, you know, they were learning how to be electricians and plumbers and, um, and all of that went away. And the vision was that um, they, would tr they would move outside of the facility during the day and get that training and education and then come back at night. Mm -hmm. And it quickly became obvious to many of us that that was not gonna happen. It was never gonna happen. Um, so, um, so that, that work of listening to stories and hearing these stories and just thinking, you know, that, but for the circumstances I was born in, that could be my complete trajectory in life. Um, it was so obvious. And then the other thing I did for a short time, I didn't mention it um, in my bio, is I ran um, Dismiss of Vermont for a year. Um, which is a, a, a program, a nonprofit that runs transitional housing in Vermont. 
and I had to go and cite a house for transitional housing in White River Junction. And I started to see what people were up against, like having to go door to door and knocking on the door and saying, we want to cite this house in your neighborhood and it's actually going to improve your neighborhood. And, um, and amazingly, people were really open to that. Um, but there were a lot of people, including a nearby church, unfortunately, um, that really fought it for a long time, for several years before it actually came to be. And it's in White River Junction, Hartford, right on the line there now. Um, but those two experiences really showed me how nearly impossible it is to successfully return to your community and actually be successful. The system is set up for people to fail completely in terms of being um, subjected to a life of poverty, getting into situations with your children where you lose custody or whatever, and then having to navigate that. Transportation issues, employment, trying to get a job that pays anything above minimum wage. I started to see the systemic forces that really keep women from re-entering successfully. So when I was elected to the legislature, one of the main things I wanted to do, even though I was placed on the Human Services Committee, which I'm, I love being on Human Services, but I knew that I had to somehow continue my work around women and incarceration, and so the Women's Caucus has been the place where, um, and, and the Women's Commission, serving on the Women's Commission, that I can kind of continue to further changes at the systemic level. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, just a few follow-up questions for you all. Ashley, you had talked about, you mentioned a little bit about the work that you're doing with the ACLU right now and the, and the six proposals that they have for change under the Smart Justice Program. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about uh, what does that term mean? Why are you calling it Smart Justice? And what are some of the proposals that you have? Yeah. So Smart Justice uh, was a national campaign that ACLU came up with to really start talking about mass incarceration. So the United States jails more people than any other country, uh, democratic country in the world, right? And so to be like a world power and how the, the US is seen, but to know that we have more people incarcerated under sort of the worst <laughs> conditions and for the smallest reasons, uh, you know, really spoke to the ACLU and many other organizations nationally and in Vermont. And so Smart Justice was launched in uh, every state and sort of tailored for that state's issues, right? Like the issues that like Los Angeles might have is very different from what we need here in Vermont and what would work for us. And so we launched Smart Justice here in Vermont uh, in January of 2018. And there's sort of different boxes, right? Everything from bail reform to prosecutorial accountability, state's attorney's accountability, to looking at probation and parole reform, sentencing reform. Um, and so there's, it's sort of every aspect of, this, of, the, of the system and how people become involved in the first place. Um, and so the first year we really focused on state's attorneys. They're elected officials, just doing, we don't you know, endorse candidates, but encouraging all of you as voters and taxpayers to understand that the state's attorneys are actually some of the most powerful people in the entire system. They decide who's charged, what they're charged for, how they're sentenced, what the sentence recommendations are. And in a state where 98% of all charges end in plea agreements, there is huge discretion there. And when there's parts of our state that are sending twice as many people to prison as other parts of our state, it raises a lot of questions about that discretion, right? And so when they're elected officials and they're coming to communities and they're saying, you know, vote for us, here's what we believe in, are they really holding up to that? That's, that's something that's important for, for you as voters to think about um, and to ask questions about. And so that's what we really started with the first year. Uh, the second year, uh, this year, we really uh, had some great work with the, the Women's Caucus, uh, great conversations with the Women's Commission. The legislature really stepped up and at the end of the session uh, added language that said that they were willing to take steps to create a smarter criminal justice system here in Vermont. And how great for our state government to be willing to start having this conversation in real ways 
uh, and we're really excited because then uh, we're working very closely with them on a process called Justice Reinvestment II. So at the height, Vermont's prison population was a little over 2,200, and they did Justice Reinvestment I, which is where they looked at policies, looked at where they could make changes, looked at where they could lower the population of people incarcerated, and, and that number came down to where we are now at about 1,700, right? So they did great work the first time around, and it saved money, and community justice centers were built, and they re that's the point, reinvesting the money. And so they're willing to take that step, but now it's a little bit harder, right? Some of the low-hanging fruit was sort of picked, and the easy conversations were had the first time of round. And so now we're moving into things like looking at removing furlough, which you heard Mary Beth talk about. Uh, when people come out of corrections, they're on community supervision. Here in Vermont, it's known as FSU or furlough. We're one of only like two states that even have that system. Mm -hmm. Most other states, you're paroled from a facility. And so that is also one of the largest drivers of reincarceration. It, it's not even necessarily new crime. People are returned to the facility in Vermont for what they call technical violations. So to know that you know those are policies we highlight in the blueprint. Those are conversations the legislature is really willing to have now, and and we're very excited about the progress that is is hopefully going to be made. Thank you. So um, Cassie, Ashley talked a little bit about. Um, challenges of when you come out of prison and if you're on furlough and um, technical violations can send somebody right back to prison and so people can be sent back to prison for not committing a whole new crime but for just <coughs> violating the conditions of their release. Um, but I know that even folks who come out who are not on furlough who are not on parole find a lot of challenges in kind of coming back to the lives that they left behind. And I know you've, had, you've done some work around that. Can you talk a little bit more about how that is? Yes, an individual who comes out, and everyone is their own individual, so every case is different, has just a lot of obstacles that you just wouldn't think exist. But of course, there's the main ones, which are housing, um, employment, and then education. Those seem to be big ones. Uh, I. The state does have a lot of different programs uh, that are implemented to assist. My personal experience is with COSA, the Circles of Support and Accountability, uh, which if all of you have a community or restorative justice center in your county, please consider getting trained and volunteering. Um, and so there's that, but then, so criminal records, once an individual has served a sentence and then time passes, there's a certain uh, list of offenses that are eligible for expungement, uh, which means it's deleted, or sealing, which means it's it, it's kept, but it's not destroyed. But it's you know there's only certain offices like the police department that keeps the record, uh, and so we've been working. And by we, I mean just the state generally. You know, many stakeholders have been working on expanding that list of eligible offenses and making it easier to get a record expunged or sealed. And there's just a lot of different moving parts and it's you know been a very interesting process. But so while we await for it to be magical and automatic and just drop off like points on our licenses, uh, I'm working to help individuals with petitions to then file with the court once they're, they've become eligible. Hmm. So I just, yeah, re-entry is, it's so, I don't want to use the word fascinating, but it just, it, it blows my mind, just the obstacles that are there. And with every individual, it's so different. And so it's just, you know, ear to the ground and then just like one person at a time, see what you can do to help them. But, yeah. Yeah. So Mary Beth, you're in the legislature now. And um, so in some ways you have some power that the rest of us don't have, and in, and in other ways you probably don't have nearly as much power as we like to think you do. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the Women's Caucus has been exclusively focusing, or almost exclusively focusing, on issues around incarcerated women this session. Um, but just in general, what, it, what the legislature has done and what can do and what you might see in the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
I think the most important thing to, you kind of alluded to this, Ashley, I mean, the amount of money that we as a state are spending on this system is massive. I mean, it's a massive, I don't know the number off the top of my head, and I should, but it is a massive amount of money. So the question um, is how do we spend that money in a way that's truly, where we're going to have really success and people are going to transition back successfully. So the legislature has been, you know, since Justice Reinvestment One, which was in the year 2007, and that basically means that we bring in a nonprofit that digs into our data and really looks at our data and says, okay, here's why your numbers are going up in this particular area. So we did that in 2007, and then out of that came some reforms in policy um, in 2008 and beyond. So um, we, did, you know, we invested more in a little bit of transitional housing. Um, we defined recidivism. We never had a definition for recidivism, so we defined that in statute. We created court diversion. Um, we recently, in 2018, made um, medi medi medication-assisted treatment available to people inside, um, people who are opiate addicted and, you know, need a way to kind of get off, you know, not, um, <coughs> you know, completely have to recover in prison without any kind of medication assistance. So. Um, we've done things, but there is so much more that we need to do. I mean, these are kind of drops in the bucket. And so Justice Reinvestment too is again working with this Council on State Governments to say what can we, you know, are, because our numbers are starting to trend up again. They're trending up again in, air, in various areas, in this area of technical violations. Um, you know, where literally someone could drive across the county line to go see a relative, and if they're caught out of the geography they're supposed to be in, they can get hauled back to prison. So, so that kind of thing is not, that's not, um, that's not, that's not smart justice. I mean, why are we doing this? So the question is, how do we begin to look at all of these intersections of probation and parole, of having to, you know, people who, um, who can't come up with bail are people who are impoverished. Those are the people who can't come up with bail. Um, so why are we creating a system that keeps the impoverished trapped in prison facilities so that they can't um, be, you know, home maybe on a, with a monitoring bracelet or something and working on their case, getting an attorney, you know, figuring out how to get, you know, how to be defended. When you're in a prison facility, you're pretty much isolated. No internet access, so there's, there's, it's really impossible to get the kind of defense and help legal advice that you really need. You're, you're relying on people who have huge caseloads and can spend about two minutes with you. So um, the Women's Caucus, that's a sorry, that's a long-winded answer to, the, when I joined the legislature, the Women's Caucus made a commitment to focus on women and incarceration for the whole biennium, so for two sessions. And I have been working with the Vermont Commission on Women on this issue of women's incarceration. So for me, it was like a no-brainer. How do we start to link up all these people and you know, kind of a herding cats exercise, really, and get everybody kind of working together on how to move things forward. And the ACLU has been working on this for many, many years. So how do we bring their voice in and attempt to really get policy that is going to bend the curve on this whole thing. So I really feel like that's my primary job with the caucus and the commission, is really getting people to talk to one another, getting committees of jurisdiction like corrections and institutions um, in the House and Senate, getting those committees to really be in good communication um, about what the best policies are that we need. Um, and so a lot of that work, once Justice Reinvestment II is completed in December, they will deliver a report explaining kind of the reasons for this num numbers creep up. Um, and then we can kind of, as legislators, really sit down and start hammering out policies. Um, but for me, it's really, I feel like there are different pockets of people who really hold knowledge and um, wisdom about what needs to happen. So my goal is to get everybody kind of like 
in communication. I think that's an unbelievably important piece of this. So, thank you. So I have a question now for any or all of you. Um, uh, Ashley had touched on the idea of uh, the, the harm that happens to families mm -hmm. when a woman is incarcerated and that um, you're incarcerating, you, think, you may think you're incarcerating one person, but you're really mm -hmm. impacting an entire family for years to come, potentially. And so I, I invite any of you or all of you to, to address um, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the ways that it really impacts families and that we, all of us, the rest of us, should be concerned about? Yeah, so uh, my daughter and I participated in a film project called Downstream. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, and it's about the effects of parental incarceration on children uh, because my voice matters a lot less than hers. Uh, and so my now almost 15-year-old daughter is in the film and, and several other children and their families and experiences. But I think collectively, uh, a couple of great sound bites for the film. I'm really happy the one's my daughter's, but uh, a couple of the other kids say really amazing things. I mean, they were just all wonderful kids. Uh, and did the film project by choice to lift up their voices, but more importantly, that there's a huge stigma around having a parent that's incarcerated for kids, right? We're starting to talk about people's gender identities. We're starting to talk about violence in the home and divorce and homelessness, right? We're starting to have these conversations with kids now in 2019. But one of the topics that's still really taboo and really hush-hush and sort of stigmatized is having a, a parent that's in jail, right? Or having to live with your grandparents because your parent's in jail or be in foster care or however it looks for those kids. And so, you know, uh, a couple things that the kids say is, um, my daughter says, said a great thing, and I wasn't part of her interview, so I'm always still amazed when I see it up on the screen. She said, at the end of the day, my mom is still a human being, and she's still my mom, mm -hmm. right? So for a child that has a corrections-involved parent, they don't see that, right? They don't see what they did wrong. They don't care about any of that. All they know is that mom or dad is gone. That's all they know. And it can be for a multitude of reasons. I was incarcerated for cashing two bad checks. I got a 14 month to four year sentence to serve for that. And they knew, and they knew that I had done that because I was an addict. They knew that I had small kids at home, right? My story is an opportunity where treatment, community support, right? Like there were, there were things I could have done in the community that would have been, A, much cheaper. I wasn't a safety risk. I wasn't abusing my children or, you know, neglecting, like they had food and clothes and, you know. So, but that's just an example. And, and my story is not special. It happens to women all the time for a multitude of crimes and reasons. But at the end of the day, it's still those kids that are left to pick up the pieces. To number one, try to understand what do I do without my mom? What do I do when I have my first heartbreak? and I can't go to my mom to get a hug. What do I do when I had a bad day at school? And the only way I get to talk to my mom is when she calls me from a prison phone and that's only if she has the money to make the call. My Saturdays are now taken up because that's the only day the jail does visiting. So the only day I can see my mom is to give up my weekend. For kids that have dads in jail, the dads don't even get nice kids, what they call kids apart visits. They have to sit across from their dads at a regular visiting room table and drive across the state. And some dads are in Mississippi right now at a private prison. So there are kids that can't even see their dads, right? So we know that the primary relationships between kids and their parents, as long as we can create safety and that they're actually physically safe, is the most important relationship for a child. And when you break that attachment, you break those kids in ways that sometimes is really unfixable. Mm -hmm. So how do we do better for families, right? Also, when you take people out of community, they can't go to work. So whether it's a woman that's sitting in jail because she can't pay her bail, or a man that's sitting in jail because she can't pay her bill, or a gender non-conforming person is in jail because they can't pay their bail, they no longer work, they're no longer helping you pay taxes, they're no longer taking care of their children. Their children are now in foster care or with other family. And there's 
a burden on the taxpayers. You're paying between sixty-five and eighty-five thousand dollars a year per inmate when much more money could be saved and much better solutions could be provided. And sometimes I, people say, well, I don't know anybody that's been to jail. Why don't they just not commit the crime, right? <laughs> don't do the crime if you can't do the time, right? We've all heard that, right? It's not that simple. It's not an episode of law and order. I didn't wake up and say, oh, I think it's a great idea to be an addict, and I'm going to go cash the bad checks and go to prison, right? Like, that was not my, my thinking. My thinking was, I am a victim of childhood trauma. I'm a victim of very violent domestic assault. I'm a victim of sexual assault. And I had no other way to survive, to deal with the trauma of everything that I had faced. And then I, now I'm a mom, and like I can't show my kids that I'm struggling, and I have to be strong, and I have to take care of them. How do I do all that? I'm only one person. And so drugs is what kept me going. Right? And so now I'm using drugs and I gotta figure out a way to keep food on the table and keep clothes on their backs and diapers on them. And so yeah, I absolutely did I absolutely did what I was accused of. I absolutely cashed those bad checks. I am hundred percent accountable. But how do you foster accountability? It's not because you threw me in jail. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not because like I'm not better today. I don't work for the ACLU today because I went to jail. Mm -hmm. Like my children healed and I healed because we got support in our community. We found great therapists. We found great mentors. We had great friends and family that believed that I was worthy and believed in my children's success, and we had great schools. You know, I walked into schools and I wasn't met with judgment and stigma. My kids' schools accepted me, always looked at me like I was their mom and nothing else mattered, right? And that was healing for my children. So it's, it's not just one piece of a conversation when you're talking about kids and families. You have to look at how this spins out. It's not just about the person you're putting in jail. There's a whole world that you decimate by doing that. Jail should be our last option, right? You don't use your worst punishment, right, if you're a parent, because your kid knocked a glass of milk off the table. Punishment and the offense need to go together, and then you teach kids how to you know, do the right thing the next time and what not to do the next time. So just because I'm 25 or 35, I don't deserve that same value, that same love, that same encouragement. We all come from different, different walks of life. We all need something different sometimes. Yeah, well said. Um, I think you're, you, you painted a, a really amazing picture of what happens for women. I mean, women's pathways to incarceration are unique. They're unique pathways. They're different than they are for men. They very much, um, you know, the, the trauma that you mentioned. I mean, there's one woman I think of all the time who um, shoplifted, but, but because it was over a certain amount of money, she went to jail. And she's been in the criminal justice system incarcerated for almost 12 years now because she's a terrible um, addiction, a terrible problem with cocaine. And so what she does is she goes on what they call escape, where she'll be you know, not in the house she's supposed to be, or she'll leave and go drug or whatever. And, and so they haul her back. And she's now been in the system for over 12 years based on that one thing that happened, which was, you know, a mistake. But, you know, again, it was to fuel a drug habit because of incredible trauma being in the foster care system, which was very difficult for her as a young girl. So it's like we, we, we've got to get a grip on um, what's really going on here and get away from this unbelievably punitive system that actually sends people out in worse shape than they went in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you and I will this. just add some couple statistics with close to 80% of the women who are currently incarcerated are in for nonviolent offenses and just about the same number of those women were sin the single caregivers for their children. So it just can go a lot of ways with, with that, but just putting those out there to maybe show just how in Vermont it's children are affected. Right. Thank you. Um, so another question kind of 
for all of you. Um, this is a, a much bigger picture, broader question, um, kind of about the, the philosophy behind why we do what we do. And uh, you know, there are different, people have different attitudes about what the purpose of incarceration is, whether it's about punishment or about rehabilitation. Um, the department that it's housed under is called corrections, which kind of implies that maybe there's some correction that needs to be made. Um, uh, but it's hard not to look at the system that we have and not conclude that it, it seems to be primarily fueled by a desire for punishment or for um, uh, avoidance, you know, trying to not deal with problems but just kind of lock them away. So I wonder if you have any perspectives on that. Maybe you want to disagree with me or maybe you want to um, talk about your, your own thoughts about that or what you see as um, changes that we might like to envision or how and how we might how we might get to something that serves everybody better than it does now. Mm -hmm. Mom, I just go ahead. Oh. <laughs> uh, so in our blueprint there's a line and it's it's sort of at the ACLU where you, especially in Vermont, right, we we don't want to talk about the why. Why do we do things? Why do things matter here? And so you know our why is really because we believe Vermont can create a system that is fair and equitable and rooted in community solutions. We believe that Vermont can do a better job. It can create a smarter criminal justice program. It's, it's literally that simple, right? I explain to people that smart justice, if you just flipped around, is like using justice smartly, right? For everyone. People that commit acts of harm matter. The victims of those acts of harm matter. And the communities that that situation is seated in matter. Right? I've lived in Vermont my whole life. I've also been many other places in my life and seeing it, Vermont is very unique. And so I think that things to really highlight, you know, when we were talking about uh, embarking on justice reinvestment too, is our lack of data. So while in previous years, the Department of Corrections did provide data and they did provide uh, information to the public, uh, they no longer do that. And so when council and state governments came in this time around to do justice reinvestment too, along with the Urban Institute that we partnered with to author the blueprint that was released yesterday, it's noted across both that there is a huge lack of data in many points in the system. Thankfully, the, the law enforcement community has done a, a much better job in the last couple of years of collecting some data, and that's great, and we hope that they continue and do more. But sort of after that, at, at, most of the, at all of the points in the system, from the state's attorneys to the corrections department to reentry, there's very little data available to understand things like, why do we have the highest racial disparity in the nation? Mm -hmm. Right? This is Vermont. That's not, that, that doesn't sound like us, right? Like some of these questions, why are people going back to jail for uh, driving to Hannaford? It's because Shaw didn't, Shaw's didn't have the formula they needed and they're out of place. I heard a, that is the term, I heard an audience member say that earlier. Uh, why are, well, that's not a new crime. So I'm spending $80,000 a year to reincarcerate someone for something that's not a new crime, right? And what are our crimes? So Vermont has one of the lowest felony thresholds. You were talking about the theft. It's $900. That right. is the lowest felony threshold in all of New England, mm -hmm. right? So where other things are misdemeanors in every state around us, in Vermont it's a felony. And then it sets us off, as you heard, those criminal records. I can't get hired at big lots. So before I worked at the ACLU, when I got out of corrections, I applied at McDonald's. I applied at big lots, right, entry level, minimum wage jobs, and I got told no, because my crimes are what they call honesty crimes, mm -hmm. right, because they involve money. But I work for the ACLU now. So the way that I'm even what they call the, the nonviolent low-level offender, which we need to change that conversation as well, mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't even get a job. So imagine for anybody that has anything above what I have, so there's many points in the system that we have an opportunity for change in. I think the data point that you brought up is really important. Um, and, and I want to just, a little bit of a disclaimer, I mean, DOC, Department of Corrections, is overseeing this whole thing. But, but we've, we, as legislators and policymakers, we've set up the system. So it's not there. You know, they're, they're basically 
you know, just following what's what's the system, what the law says. So, um, you know, they, they definitely, um, you know, on probation and parole at times make calls that I wouldn't agree with, but I feel like we've got to, we've got to get the data together. We've got to figure out, like, what's happening with this um, unbelievable rise in the number of black Vermonters who are ending up in car, like, what is going on? Like, how is that happening? 10% um, of incarcerated people now in the state of Vermont are black, and that's, you know, that, that doesn't even match our demographic, our pop, you know, what our population is. So we need to, we need to start um, disaggregating data and, and recording it by, by gender, by race. We need to really understand that. And that will inform smart policy. We can't, you know, we all have as legislators ideas about what, what could kind of be the lever to kind of change things here and there. But we need the data in the end to really look at what's gonna truly work, what's gonna be effective. So I think the data piece is huge. I, I was really thrilled to see that in the smart justice recommendations, because I do think that's what policymakers are looking for. Every time we go to DOC and say, can we have this data? And they're like, well, we don't really collect that. But we haven't demanded that they, and we haven't asked them to collect it. Mm -hmm. So we've got to start being very specific about the data that we need. So that's one, one thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to see. Well, there's so many changes <laughs> uh, that could occur in the system. And so I then, because I realize everyone is focusing on that, we've got a lot going on, and I'm just like, oh, go to the outside. Like, you know, when children are young, you know, kind of divert if any are on their way. Mm -hmm. And then again, you know, just, okay, you were in. There's a lot that needs to change for those who will, you know, maybe in in the future, but let's focus on keeping you out. And I think it's interesting you mentioned um, defining recidivism because I could talk for the next hour about how I think that definition needs to actually be updated, uh, changed a little bit. And be, and it comes around to the furlough and then you know the technical violations and someone's considered um, recidivating because you know they went back in for a technical violation and that, that's not a new crime and so it's just it'll be interesting to see how what all, all of this this data does uh, but I just it's and change is slow especially when we're talking about policy so mm -hmm. That's why it's like, don't get frustrated, you know, right. let them keep working on it, and then all of us can just find our ways to trickle into people's lives and just find common ground with other people and realize that an individual who was incarcerated is not that different from us. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add before uh, Carrie tells me to be quiet, <laughs> uh, do any of you feel unsafe with me in the room? Anybody? <laughs> because, well, I'm asking that, and it's kind of funny, but like, I'm a felon, right? Those labels we give people. I'm a junkie. I was a heroin addict, right? Like, I'm a criminal. So these scary labels that we put on people is not defining who they are, right? I am more than the worst thing I've ever done, and trust me, cashing those bad checks was not the worst thing I've ever done, <laughs> okay? Like, let, let's just keep it real. <laughs> but to be, like, I'm more than that, and look at who I am today, right? And that was because my community and the people that cared about me rallied around me. How many of us is, have needed that at one point in our life? Right? Like we've all made mistakes, we've all done things, we've all, some people have cheated on their spouse, some people lie on their taxes, like there, there's a multitude of things, right? Stealing office supplies. We're like one decision or one unfortunate circumstance from being those people that are sitting in jail, right? Not everybody that, that comes in contact with the system are the worst of the worst like we see on TV every day. That is not the case. That, that for me was the value of hearing the stories. You hear the stories and you hear the stories and, you're, and you think to yourself, um, you, you know, oh my gosh, th th that, that could be me. But for my circumstances, mm -hmm. that could absolutely be me. And so it really, you know, really changed my perspective in huge ways about, you know, uh, right, we are way more than our worst decision. I mean, our... Yeah, if I, we all have we all have those little caverns of yeah. incredibly bad decisions, you know. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying that. 
Um, so you mentioned stories, Mary Beth, and um, you all have kind of have touched on this Writing Inside Vermont program. We've heard about it. The program that it has is in the Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, and women are learning about writing and um, learning about different skills associated with that. And all of you have had some kind of involvement with it in some way. And it's a pretty powerful, pretty amazing program. Um, and we have somebody here tonight who can do a reading, I believe, from the latest book. And so I would like to invite her to do that. Yeah. My name's Danielle Benoit. Um, I just recently did three years um, in Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility. Um, I, too, am a dangerous felon. Um, when I got arrested for my sale, I had already been clean for about two months. Um, I went to rehab on my own. Um, I actually geographically relocated to Kentucky and like did everything in my power to get off dope. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say something bad about jail, but jail saved my life. Um, mm -hmm. I honestly believe that if I didn't get taken out of what I was doing, I probably wouldn't have been clean as long as I have been. Um, I'll be 36 months and not next month, but the month after. Um, so it's been, it's been a long road, but like because of going to jail, I have a scholarship to UVM. Um, I also have a 3.8 GPA from there. Um, I have multiple certificates, uh, flagging OSHA, surf safe, you know, like um, I took jail and I used it for everything that they still give us. Um, so writing inside was like my favorite thing to do. Um, Cassie picked a few, but after hearing the discussion on like kids and, and what we lose, um, I kind of picked a different one, more about you know, what addiction does to people and what jail does to people. So this is called normalizing the abnormal. Uh, the mind is such an amusing organ. Not amusing as in funny or a jester drawing attention of royalty. Amusing as a perfect reason to be imperfect. Just when you believe yourself to be complacent, something comes around to tear apart your self-appointed magnificence. It's amazing what a person can survive. Every kind of pain listed with a check mark next to it like a roll call of every undeserving tear. Yet the smallest of battles and she loses the ability to thrive. I've woken up at age 12 when most are hoping to go to the movies past 10 p.m. and because of being molested, my abortion had to be done in time to catch the school bus. At 17, I lived alone. My daughter, a cat, and Wren all looking at me at, for what? Something I wasn't sure of. But the cat liked the milk so much that it chewed up most of the baby's bottles. By 21, I had three kids and no one to help us, but I didn't mind. I worked every day, sun up to sundown with no fuss. My girls deserved the world and I had no shame in that. My spiritual integrity broke the day I joined the game. I've become a broken record playing the mishaps, mishaps, playing the mishaps over again. My insecurities grow like a seed that was put in the pot in the garden with razor wire holding out the smile with the pain. I miss being just a little bit around the rain. I miss the tiny hugs that made me feel loved by the ones whose eyes gave me the shine to begin with. Why can't I keep that as my normal? I'd like to have normalize my normal, but my normal is abnormal, so how will I know which normal is normal because abnormal sure feels normal to me. <laughs> Laborings in my blood, the hustle as most called it, was nothing but lame, and I was about as good at selling drugs as Helen Keller was at coloring in the lines. Before I knew it, I was paying Vermont restitution and fines, 260 pounds of confidence to fill a truck. I could be anything, a carpenter, a chef, photographer, landscaper, carny, a little bit of Barney deserved. But all that said, I've dealt with some shit and dealt with it all smiling. All right, maybe my teeth were a little grit. Beat, raped, overworked, and alone. Some, sometimes I didn't have a home, but I was fine with a smile. But here, this place can kill the light. A woman who has unequivocally valued herself became fearful of her own thoughts, ashamed of her weight when she'd never been in any physically different state. Her once impermeable thoughts became bended and worn. What is normal? In order to solidify, he must stop being so vulnerable. I never knew that I could feel this way again. Normalizing normal is harder than normalizing a bad habit. I can tell you that for free. It was easy to pick up a needle and become used and washed up and frail. Yet an AA meeting or playing a sport can be worth picking on somebody. You get teased for being a good person around here. 
You get laughed at for having manners. How can it be normal to laugh at someone with scars on her frail arms because, some, because of some sad underlying reason? To viciously take it out on every kind, sad, equally broken soul around you. Wow. Thank you so much for that. I'm so glad you were here and able to share that with us. Thank you. So we have some time now for questions from the audience. And I'm wondering uh, if anyone has anything that they would like to ask any of our panelists. Yes. Uh, my name is Jacob So. I've been a Kosa volunteer for about five years in front of the Human Justice Agency. And I recognize that my comments are somewhat parochial to focus on what I've seen. But when folks come out on furlough, the likelihood of recidivism or reincarceration seems so high to me for two reasons. First of all, when people come out, in many cases they have no support from their family. Uh, they have no skills. They may still be addicted in one form or another. Finding housing borders on impossible, especially not good. Um, finding a job is incredibly difficult. And it's invariably minimal wage, minimum wage jobs. That's the first part. But come out unprepared, and the lack of support in the community seems so massive. We who serve on COSA panels do our best, but we're not very weak. We're not therapists, we're not case managers, we don't have any support to give. We, you know, we, are, we are de facto community members, de facto family members. That's the first problem. The second problem actually bothers me more, and that is that there are policies and practices that make it, by, by the correction system, that make it incredibly difficult for people to succeed. They have to pay restitution out of their minimum wage pay. Uh, they have to go to a therapy and meetings and things like this in the middle of the day, making it extra hard to get work. Mm -hmm. uh, they are limited in where they're going to live, and then they have to get to work somehow. Uh, in one situation, somebody's living on a bus route far out with occasional bus service. He can't get a job because he's living in a rural community. So all of these, these second policies really trouble me. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that the efforts at rehabilitation and restoration are hobbled by what I suspect and fear is a desire for vengeance, for punishment. And that troubles me. I'd just be interested in your thoughts and comments about that. Uh, I, have a, I have a couple of thoughts. So, uh, you brought up sort of the first part, right, which is coming out sort of unprepared and, and with, you know, not that many supports, especially in a lot of our communities in Vermont, right? Like unless you live in pretty much Chittenden County, you know, public transportation gets a little bit difficult. I mean, some places have a little bit, like here is a little bit, St. Albans has a little bit. Uh, but let me give you an example of a day in the life of somebody on furlough, okay? So if you're lucky, you get curfew. So your curfew is 7 a.m. to 7 at night. So you have to be at your house until 7 a.m. You have to be in the door at 7 o'clock on the dot at night. So in that time, it's actually not 7 o'clock because at your transitional living house, you have to be there for dinner, and that's mm -hmm. 6 o'clock. Right. So now we're 7 a.m. to 6 o'clock. And you have to be there to sit down and eat and, and right. interact. It's a requirement or right. you lose your house. Right. You lose your housing. Okay? So in the morning, if you even are lucky enough to get to take a bus, you have to take a bus. Most bus rides, even in Chittenden County, average about 45 minutes. So now we're at 8 o'clock. You have to see your probation officer. So that takes about an hour. We're at 9 o'clock. But then your probation officer has decided that you need to uh, go to programming, right? They want you to go to a risk reduction class, which is anywhere from three times a week to once a week from 9 to 11 o'clock. So now you do that. Well, now you need to find a job, though, right? Because you need to pay restitution. You need to pay rent where you live. How are you supposed to do all that in one day? And then go to AA and NA and go to individual counseling and try to reconnect with your family and your children and still manage to get the bus schedule in there and all the transportation. That is literally what it, there's not enough time in there, correct? Right? Like, there's only so many hours between the, those times. And so it is 
it's impossible. It is, it is a setup for failure. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Most people in Vermont, like less than 1% of people that are incarcerated get life. So that means everyone else is coming back to your community. So my question always to community members is, if they're, if, if they're all coming out of corrections anyway, and they're gonna move in next door to you, and your family and your loved ones, how do you want them to come out? Would you rather someone got a lengthy jail sentence and come out the way the system currently is and with the lack of resources that there currently is? Or would you rather someone get no jail time or, very, or maybe a very small sentence but get support, come out to community resources, come out to therapy, come out to the things that they need to be successful? Because they're moving in next door either way. So how do you want your community to look? How are we creating public safety, right? That's just exactly my point. Thank you. Can I say yeah. something about that? Yeah, yeah, please do. So I personally have gone back to jail on furlough um, once for taking an extra shift at work because I didn't call my PO to change my schedule. Um, and the second time I posted a picture with somebody that my mom didn't like on Facebook, she called my PO, said I was hanging out with bad people, went back to jail. Um, both those times I did nothing wrong at all. Um, also, there's probably like more than half of the women at Chittenden Regional that are in there for lack of residence and probably more than half of those women have somewhere to go, but furlough won't approve it. My mom called every day for about two months, my caseworker, central office. I wrote to people at central office. They wouldn't let me go to my parents' house because my dad had guns. He was willing to move those guns. He was willing to bring them to my brother-in-law's house, but they said because he owned them and they were all in his name that it was still a risk for me. None of my charges have anything to do with weapons, but because I'm a felon, I can't be near or around them. These are, these are the kinds of things that have to, that we've got to change, you know, we've got to change. And, and there is tremendous discretion on the part of probation and parole in making these decisions. So it's also looking at that, like how, like how are we going to change that system? Because depending, also I've seen, depending on what county you are in, people will make different decisions. So we need to, we need to really, we need to have some kind of process that's gonna set people up for success. I would add though, we need to address what I believe is a desire for punishment and vengeance. Yeah, and totally. It's a culture, it's a culture, culture change. The other thing I wanna say, just cause I have to get this in, um, having tried to cite a house for people coming out of prison, um, this was a, a community in White River Junction. Um, it was a dilapidated house that the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board wanted to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in. It was a historic home to bring it back to its original beauty, um, and, it, and they did that, um, and have it be a home for um, eight to 12 um, people coming out of incarceration with supervision there. Um, don't fight those houses in your community. People do. I'm, I'm, I'm from Essex, and right now there are community members fighting sober housing in our community. Um, we need this housing. People need to be relocated to their communities. So we, you know, so, you know, and it was surprising to me the people who were, who were fighting it. There are people like me. So, um, you know, do, do what you can to grease the wheels and make those projects possible in your communities. These are community members, and like Ashley said, 98% are coming back to the community where they came from. So are we setting them up for success? That's a huge piece. And also affordable housing. There are a lot of Vermonters who are fighting um, investments in VHCB to create affordable housing. We need this housing desperately. There are um, 500 um, Vermonters in prison now for lack of housing, for just, lack of safe housing. And to just kind of expand, when an individual is sentenced in Vermont, they have a minimum and a maximum sentence. So once they've hit the minimum time served and have been on good behavior, they then become eligible to spend the rest of their sentence out in the community. And those, so they say lack of housing, those are all the people who could, if they got housing approved, there was housing available, could be out in the community now. 
So they're just sitting there waiting. Again, kind of like with Danny, she had the housing, it wasn't approved, so she waited even longer. So that's what we mean by. We have a question right here. Yes. How do we prevent the activities that lead to the initial incarceration? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say the same way we deal with the people coming out, right? Like if we have mm -hmm. solutions rooted in communities, those solutions are also there to support people at the entry points. There's a lot of on-ramps to being corrections involved. There's very few off-ramps, right? So if we were to expand diversion programs, if we were to expand restorative justice centers and practices, if we were to expand mental health and housing, right? if we were to address some of the, the issues around poverty and homelessness and, and all of the issues that get people there, right, the same things we need to help people come back to community, then people would have somewhere to go for the help that they need. People would have the resources to deal with some of the issues that lead them to commit crime. Yes, right here. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you say there's a lot of people in prison that just don't have a place to go. Well, I've been on the board of the Disney's House um, in Burlington for about six years. And I think in the last year or so, they said no more women. What can we do about that? I mean, that was, for 30 years, they were having men and women together. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was good for everybody. And then the Department of Corrections says no more. It was it was it a Department of Corrections decision? Yes. I okay, it was. I, I don't know. So I, I mean I have the actual answer to that. <laughs> so A, I lived in a Dismas house, a co ed Dismas house. I lived in the Winooski house. Uh, it's an amazing program that made me feel at home and gave me a family and really great dinners every night. I saw you there one. Yeah, yeah. I speak of my story transparent. I always tell people that know me in different ways, like feel free to say that you know me. Uh, I was in jail with Danny. I still have a picture that she drew me, whether she knows it or not. Yeah. Uh, so um, what happened was a female house resident uh, made an accusation of sexual assault against a male uh, resident. It was like just patting her on the back or something. I can't get into details. What I can say is that was the accusation. And so uh, the Chittenden County, it started with just Chittenden County. Uh, probation and parole office decided that despite the fact that there was two houses, one in Minuski and one in Burlington, so maybe they could have made one for women, one for men, et cetera, uh, they decided to block women from going to distance house collectively in Chittenden County. At the same time, the tapestry program in Brattleboro which was a transitional program for women, also closed. So in the last 18 months, women have lost 40 transitional housing beds with nothing to replace it. And so the, the rest, Dismas House of Vermont, collectively followed suit and have now blocked women from going to any. All four houses now. Right? Yes. So that's why. And so my question is, you know, we could get into a whole conversation about that's an example of how a woman was a victim in that case, mm -hmm. and then all women were penalized because of it. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of, of what we're talking so about. So what can we do about that? Mm -hmm. So honestly, anybody that has a contract with DOC and receives funding for them, like many of the transitional housing programs, pretty much all of the transitional housing programs in Vermont, receive money from the Department of Corrections and are required to adhere to their uh, policies and directives. For every one women's silver house, there's five men's houses, and for every one bed, there's nine beds for men. So I came in late, so I apologize if this was already discussed and I didn't hear it, but I would, I'm under the impression that it's about $67,000 a year to house somebody in the prison. And did you already discuss, like, what are the barriers? getting that money shifted over uh, and the other so you did already discuss that uh, we talked about the cost right. okay. yes yeah yeah because that, it's higher question, than that it's higher than yeah. that oh yeah because that question of how to get that money shifted if we've got 500 people in jail who could be out mm -hmm. 500 times 70,000 mm -hmm. or whatever right how do we get that money shifted and the other thing I would just say about the, the comment about like the women's beds and business house. 
like there's like at least 35 people in here. Who to call? Who to like put pressure on? I mean, I think that's the piece about all of us pushing the system. Absolutely, absolutely. I would say call your, well, most of you are probably Montpelier. Call your representative, call your senator, call the speaker. I mean, you know, make it, make it a priority. You know, um, I mean, that's how a lot of issues in the state house get, you know, get a focus in a session is for people to really say, this needs to change. I don't want my money funding this anymore. Um, we need to figure out, it is such a complex system the way it is set up now that it's not as easy as like, oh, let's just move the money there. We need the housing in the community. We don't have the proper housing. We don't, we need, um, really wrap around reentry that's going to really you know that's going to provide the mental health counseling all of the workforce training all of those pieces and and the money right now you know we don't have money for that i mean there the other thing i want to say about dismiss having worked for dismiss do you know what in, in the days when i worked there do you know what the doc pays them um, per day per person, eighteen dollars in the day that I work there. It's not much more now. <laughs> okay, okay, good to know. But like, how can you truly? So that's the thing that the money, the funding has to be reinvested into the or re truly rehabilitative programs. But but they have to be developed and they have to be invested. And my husband runs a nonprofit in Burlington. And one of the issues they're really dealing with right now is being level funded by the state for so many years. They offer these services for people at risk, and um, you know it's really hard. You know we have limited state dollars, so it's very tricky. How do we how do we make sure that we're investing in the programs that really work, that really are successful? So that's a whole piece of determination that needs to happen too. But when like I said it's eighteen dollars for dismiss versus I know. I know. I know. All right, we're getting close to the end of our time. I think I have for one more uh, uh, this isn't a ahead. question but for those people who don't know for, um, the statewide organization VIA yes. is having a yeah. meeting at St. Paul's Cathedral in Burlington on October 29th in the evening to talk to the Commissioner of Corrections and a couple of other people. It just would be interesting. What's the organization? So it's, 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 it's Vermont Interfaith Action. And what they do is they study um, an issue for a year and they have an action, they organize, they get people together um, to really kind of put a stake in the ground around a certain issue. And their issue is in, I mean, in incarceration. I mean, is it women's incarceration or in, I think it's incarceration. So they're specifically talking about CRCF oh, they and are. the event in October. Okay. okay, great. So they have this event coming up and um, I think the other group is cr uh, Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. They're doing a lot of good work. I think that people organizing and coming together and really, you know, insisting that some of these changes come down the pike is really, really important. And I want to note that uh, big Vermont corporations that live and love and work and build in Vermont, uh, like Ben and Jerry's partner for the ACLU and Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform, to come out with Justice Remix and start having these conversations. Cabot uh, has uh, begun building the Cabot Centennial Reentry Project. So, I mean, talk about what you're doing with that. That's really interesting. Sure. So, uh, Cabot began the, the Cabot Centennial Reentry Project, uh, specifically focusing uh, on the women right now. Uh, really talking about, so our agricultural community is, is aging up, right? And uh, it's getting more difficult for families to keep their farms, to produce the milk and the items, obviously, that, that go into the sheep. Uh, and so the group of farmers that own Cabot uh, were like, man, how can, we, how can we do something different? How can we keep our farms, keep our communities going? Like, this is Vermont, right? These rural communities. And, and how can we figure this out? And so uh, building a reentry project around 
uh, women coming out of corrections? How do we support them? How do we link them up with farms that need help? How do we, how do we link them up with jobs in our production plants? You know, how can we keep this conversation going? And so um, there are many there are large corporations in Vermont that are really starting to, to get into this conversation because everyone can see that there's a need for change. So I want to thank all of you so much. Uh, we can certainly talk about this for hours. Yeah. But we don't yeah. have enough. Could we have another reading? <laughs> You're in charge. <laughs> it's your show. Absolutely, of course. Yeah. This is called Painting Your Life. Uh, my world began in white and black. Not black and white like you typically expect. Most of the whites were slowly changing. Mostly the gray. But the older I got, one day when I got a cut, I saw a deep burgundy jerk from my veins. Whenever I craved to see color, I knew where to turn. A nick here, a razor blade there, until black was the color that ran out of me. The next color was a small blue line, and when I snorted it, the sky turned blue. A green pill ingested and crushed made me see green grass. I cracked the code, and I finally found a way to live without all the blacks and grays. But it always ran out. You always have to start over. So the more I did, the brighter life became, but the darker my picture was when my powdery paint was gone. Till one day there was no color. I tried and tried, but color never came. I put the paint straight to my veins, and a dim glow came to the distance. More, I thought, and more is what I did. But white was all I saw, and when I woke up, it went straight to black. You think you've got it all figured out, and when you start with one color, it makes the light, but the more you add, the darker you'll get. You can't make yellow with black and gray, and you can't make blue with all your pain. At the end of the day, when your canvas is white, just start slowly, you'll make it right. Your attitude is like a palette of colors constantly painting your life. Thank you.